Hello, and welcome to another episode of MetaViews, where we look at uh, technology, power, and society by really trying to think about how the news and policy and research have a, a, a role in helping us understand our society, and in particular with a lens on accessibility and participation, that we not only like to talk about technology and policy and all the important things in our lives, but, you know, we also like to do so in a very interactive format, in, in a way that makes it easier for people to really share their own opinions, uh, feel as if they are welcome when it comes to policy in general, and to generally feel as if the world of technology, if the world of policy is for all of us, that it should benefit all of us, and therefore we should all participate in, in the way in which we think of these things. So as per our usual salon, we've brought together uh, a group of MetaViews members who are interested to weigh in with their thoughts in these policies. And we've also, uh, as per usual, have a couple of leads. Uh, we usually like to use a news hook, or in this case, a research hook. So we've got a couple of our friends from the springboard policy outfit and they recently put out a great paper called charting our own course which looks at Canadian uh, space policy and while we are gonna have a very heavy focus on Canada and Canada's role in sort of space exploration in general we are gonna talk about it in terms of a big picture perspective so for those of you watching at home if you're not Canadian if you don't care about Canada by all means space affects all of us right it's not necessarily divided into national jurisdiction so i think it's uh important for us in using canada as a context to really think about space in a global in a multinational in an interjurisdictional context and i think that's one of the the main focuses of today so as i mentioned um we're really fortunate to have a couple of leads today in the form of noah zon and alana daramchi so i'm gonna really just turn it over to you guys and ask you to maybe start by saying you know how did you why why this particular policy area what was it that motivated you or that excites you about this area and you know then maybe roll into some of the stuff that you guys have in your report so that we can perhaps get a better sense of what are the policy issues in space that are most relevant or most important for us as as lay people as average citizens to be able to participate and engage <clears throat> thanks jesse uh and i think I'll, I'll kick off uh, just with that um, that question in terms of uh, what brought us to this, because uh, we're certainly not the most uh, conventional folks to uh, have put out a discussion paper on uh, on space policy or to be here uh, leading a conversation, because we are coming to it more as uh, as lay people ourselves, at least from a space part of it. Uh, we're, we're experts in, in in public policy, is what we do, and so the the real genesis of of this uh, of this work for us, I can I can pinpoint, uh, and it was it was in a conversation that um, started by noticing something on Twitter, as as many of our uh, of days might happen, um, and and someone had flagged that in the terms of service for Starlink, uh, that to use the services, you have to concede that while services on Earth or the Moon uh, will be governed by the laws of California for services on Mars or in transit to Mars, that the parties recognize Mars as a free planet and that no Earth-based government has authority or sovereignty over Martian activities. Now, like, I think it's easy to write this off as a bit of silliness. I I'm not a lawyer, but I don't think that courts are given to defer entire planets worth of jurisdiction based on, uh, on terms of service from a satellite internet service. Uh, and this could be just sort of Elon being Elon or space nerds having a bit of fun. And that was my first reaction, and that's what intrigued me about it. But, you know, as I thought about it a bit, my own reaction was, yeah, we've seen this movie before, and it didn't turn out that well. Um, you know, corporate colonization efforts free of rule of law don't have a great history. Uh, and we are at a point where private-led missions might be among the first to send astronauts to, to Mars and other destinations. So what kind of precedents are we setting? Uh, and even if it feels like something out of the prologue to mediocre science fiction, uh, you know, it is, it is our reality. Uh, but in a maybe less grand implication, I was also thinking about 
you know, other areas of technology that are more, uh, more grounded on earth, uh, literally where tech companies, you know, tend to establish their own facts on the ground, um, whether we're talking about, you know, social media or very tangible established areas of regulation, like Uber with taxi law or Airbnb with, ho with hotel and other regulations where companies have come in and decided to declare that, you know, established rules don't necessarily apply uh, to them based on their interpretation. Uh, so we started to explore this a little bit uh, along with Vas Bednar, who I, you know, has been uh, a guest here. Um, and uh, at the same time, we noticed that the Canadian Space Agency was launching this consultation about Canada's future in space, which is which is ongoing right now. And uh, and this, uh, you know, usually government consultations, it's part of what I spend a lot of my time focused on, don't tend to be high profile events. It seems to be real crickets compared to the level of importance our entire future uh, on this planet and beyond. Um, and I think that's because this is so often framed as an industry technocratic thing where maybe you don't need the PhD in rocket science, but you need a better scientific understanding than, than I'll boast uh, to be able to you know, have table stakes. Uh, but you know, I think the policy implications matter uh, even if you're not particularly bullish on space, they matter for lots of things uh, right here day to day. And so that's the sort of uh, context which drew us into it. But uh, maybe from there, uh, I'll throw it to Alana and she can share some of her perspective and maybe touch on some of what we focused on. Yeah, thanks, Noah, and thanks, Jesse. Um, so first of all, again, I'm also not a space expert, uh, but very excited or was very excited and still am excited to engage with this topic. Um, so like aside from personally being a very avid sci-fi fan, um, all the space movies, that's kind of what I've been spending my COVID time watching, um, that escapism. But aside from that <laughs> kind of personal context, um, I have a background in global affairs and have largely kind of focused on innovation topics as well as natural resource topics. And for me, space kind of represented this like very interesting, sometimes terrifying from my perspective, marriage of kind of these three areas. So like Jesse already mentioned, space, you know, we're not just talking about Canada. Like this is what I consider like a fundamental global affair or outside of that realm even. Um, one where the actions of one country or in our present context, a company can have wide ranging implications um, for everyone around the world um, and perhaps beyond. Um, and then also from the natural resource angle, like a lot of what's being talked about in the news right now is kind of um, you know, space is a global commons. That's generally the consensus, unless you're Donald Trump um, with his most recent executive order, which he indicated that he did not think that was the case. Um, but being like a global commons, that means it's a shared natural resource space that's kind of outside of any national jurisdiction. Um, so what can we do with those resources are important questions. And third is kind of the innovation angle, you know, space kind of or more so our use or an exploration of it requires advanced technologies and the sector itself is kind of a rapid sphere of rapid innovation. So kind of when you bring those three things together, the global affairs angle or even smaller international relations angle, the technology and innovation angle, and then the natural resources angle, I think we can see that there's kind of a lot of complicated questions um, and potential issues that we need to kind of get on the same page about um, and explore deeper. Some of the things that we do cover in the discussion paper, which was meant to be very high level and kind of accessibly written, um, were things like kind of economic benefits. Um, so who gets the benefits of commercial activities in space from an international perspective, which states um, have the capacity to go out or the companies to go out on their behalf and kind of get these resources um, and make economic benefits um, from them, as well as kind of on a more on a smaller scale if we're talking about which companies actually get, not a smaller scale, a different scale uh, to go out um, and do this you know, space exploration, like it's very high risk, um, it's very expensive, um, it favors in a way dominant firms and countries like Canada have put out programs to help scale up our startups um, and smaller companies, um, but we are a smaller player. And how do we compete um, effectively with larger firms without being shut out um, or dominated excessively? That's kind of one issue area. There's also the natural resources exploration and use area or space mining. Um, so again, it being a global commons, there's a bit of legal, I guess, ambiguity, uh, where some people say, like, it's clear that you can't own the moon, 
but what can you do with the resources on the moon is another question entirely. And there's a bit of disagreement or ambiguity of what's allowed. And we've seen certain select countries put out their own national commercial laws um, to try and establish that you can own the resources on things like the moon or asteroids or other celestial bodies, um, which has caused a bit of disagreement. Um, and we're still waiting to see what will happen with that. And it's something that we should really consider. Um, another thing we've discussed is orbital, de orbital debris or space junk um, mm -hmm. more commonly. So activities in space can create junk for lack of a better word or <laughs> kind of human made pieces um, of space kind of objects that are left in space when they're no longer in use. Um, and that has implications for safety. Even a small piece can cause vast damage. Sometimes it might come back down to earth that could also be a problem. And it's also creating this situation where it's becoming increasingly hard to exit Earth's orbit and even go into space, which is something about the sustainability um, of space, if this is to keep happening at an increased scale without any intervention. Um, kind of, we talked about a few other things, but for me, one of the most interesting aspects um, as someone very interested in global affairs is that we've kind of seen a shift from more of an pursuing international kind of traditional channels of international law um, to more bilateral or more so unilateral action um, towards establishing codes of behavior or what are the rules for space. Um, and that's very interesting because things like the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, um, which is kind of the, the primordial, like this is the space law um, that exists right now, um, that has had wide uptake, has been very successful relatively speaking, at keeping space open for international cooperation, rather than competition and confrontation. Um, that especially being that it was developed in the context of nuclear disarmament in the Cold War. Um, it obviously wasn't built for kind of the commercial space race that we're seeing today. Um, so kind of the question of moving away from that, what are the implications of pursuing more unilateral and bilateral action um, for having space being this wide vast thing that affects us all if we have kind of regimes in place that aren't cooperative or kind of contradict each other, how are we supposed to effectively regulate um, and control behavior in space? Um, it's kind of a very interesting question for me to pursue. And, There's a lot and, to consider. And, and I, I kind of feel that the way you framed it, Alana, is, is really quite brilliant because it evokes the idea that policy is where we project our hopes and fears and desires, right? It's yeah. it's where we dream of the future and space policy even more so, right? That this is, you know, the long-term future. And, and the way I tried to frame today's discussion from the Canadian context is, you know, we have a history in aerospace research. We have a history in mining and mining technology and mining methods around the world. So you could almost see as if we have the potential to swing above our weight class, but only if the rules are fair, right? Only if the, the rules are clear, because if it's, you know, China versus America versus Russia, then we're kind of left out. And to your point, it almost seems as if we're at this point where the, we need a policy renewal. We need a policy upgrade that kind of acknowledges where the new technology lies, but also where the risks are. And, and I think, Noah, to your point, you know, space traditionally is not very participatory. Space policy is usually left to the experts, the scientists, the, the big aerospace industry. And yet, thanks to science fiction, right? Lana, to your points, thanks to a pandemic where we've all been watching a lot of science fiction, I think there is a base level of literacy for people to, to share their view, for people to participate, and most importantly, to project their hopes, their visions for our future, our you know, interplanetary future, right? To Noah's point about the, you know, the, the, Mar the Mars kind of fine print in the Starlink Terms of Service. So this is where I'll, I'll take a structural moment to remind our friends on Zoom to use the raise hand feature because with 12 participants is the easiest way for me to guarantee uh, you have an opportunity to participate. Uh, similarly, our friends on Twitch, uh, feel free to post comments there. Uh, Nuviak just pointed out that Elon is the Dodge the Doge coin of human beings, which perhaps speaks to the meme economy that is currently part of space policy and the way in which space policy
policy now is being more influenced by memes maybe than politicians. Um, but also there's the chats here on Zoom and Sumit uh, asked a question, can you help identify how we define space? As I understand, it's broken up into different sectors of commercial activity. Are we looking at it as a whole while making decisions that consider economic impact? Or, you know, the same way that we've divided the world into nations, are we going to start dividing space, whether in national categories or sectoral categories or treaty-based categories? I, I mean, that's that's a great question. How, how do you guys define space or how do you see others, i.e. policymakers, defining space in this in this broader context? Uh, I can take a first crack at that and then I'll, Alana can uh, add or, or correct me. Uh, the latter happens more often um, uh, than I'd like to admit. Um, you know, I think there's the, there's, depends on who you ask. There's the, I think more traditionally we see, um, you know, from an economic development standpoint, it being defined as, you know, aerospace, uh, you know, there's sort of specific industry codes and, but uh, more tied with, you know, the companies involved in the technology that sends, uh, objects out of Earth's orbit, uh, but less traditionally tied, I'd say, to um, the activities tied with things that end up in that orbit. So how much of the ICT sector uh, relying on um, satellites, uh, you know, connects into that? How much of the, uh, the biotechnology that's informed by space related research gets played into that because there's the knock on effects of that. Uh, so if we've been looking at it from the perspective of this, um, of this discussion paper, it's importance for Canadians. There's a, there's a fact that, I mean, I think it came from the aerospace industry. So, you know, maybe take it with a grain of salt, but there was a fact that, um, uh, or stylized fact, I should say, that said that space touches our lives uh, 20 to 30 times a day through the different technologies. Um, and I think that that, that struck me as somebody who doesn't think of myself as working in the aerospace industry or, you know, I'm not great with heights, likely to go, um, you know, into space in my lifetime. Um, so I think we're looking at it for that broader benefit. But I think in terms of who gets to be part of that conversation, you know, do you need to literally have a, a rocket, uh, a rocket science degree or a, a big warehouse that manufactures rocket or rocket parts to play in the conversation? It's closer. I don't want to be too malicious about it uh, or ascribe too malicious of a perspective about it, but just to get sort of concrete, you know, public consultations tend to just follow up with whoever's participated in the last public consultation. It doesn't need to be trying to shut people out to effectively do so. So we're not space policy people, but we put together this discussion paper with input paper with input from a bunch of people and submitted it. And after we submitted it, then we got an invitation to the webinars that are supposed to be the core of the consultation. <laughs> so if you're only gonna invite the people and to who are already participating in your conversation, I don't think you're doing a bang up job of, of outreach. And I don't, yeah. I don't want to pick on the people of the Canadian Space Agency because that's, that's quite typical. But, you know, that's because we define the stakeholders here very narrowly instead of all people. Yeah. Well, especially given the proliferation of consultative technology, that makes it really easy to engage large crowds. Alana, did you want to weigh in on that? Um, not particularly. I think Noah covered it very well on the, like, it depends who you ask or what your definition of space activities would be, whether it's the knockoff effects um, that we see in healthcare industries um, today, or very much things that are more, con feel more concrete like space, like space tourism um, and space mining and things that are physically done in outer space, of which the definition, um, I'm not a space scientist, uh, but I know there's distance from the earth, and at a certain point, you're in space. Well, and, and I think, you know, there's a real legal need here to 
create these types of definitions because they are political in the economic sense of different companies are going to have different reasons for this. Now, John, here, here's what I want to bring you into the chat just as you take a sip of coffee, partly because I think you've made a couple of comments in the Zoom chat that I'd like you to articulate on air because I think it illustrates this point we've just discovered that there has to be rules because short of rules, it's just a cash grab, right? Except instead of a land-based cash grab, it's an entirely different kind of cash grab, especially if you think about the way in which the gig economy, the way companies like Uber and Airbnb took advantage of outdated regulatory policy to their benefit, but to society's harm, I almost feel like we're hearing this, the same potential, the, the same threat that if we allow the Starlinks, if we allow the, the big aerospace companies to do whatever they want, there, there will be terrible consequences. Do you wanna share your thoughts on that, John? Well, sure, you're absolutely right. The consequences are inevitable. I think that uh, if we were arguing about the gig economy back in the age of the railroad, people would be trying to classify cattle as, you know, contractors or something, <laughs> because there's absolutely no sense to how they do things. Um, there's aggressive actions to get ahead of legislation, like we're seeing with Elon's company. There is companies that are trying to create a policy with the government but with an eye towards getting those lucrative contracts, there's no overarching reason for people to behave according to any kind of international standards. The first time the United States accepted copyright, it was after 100 years of ignoring copyright. And it's going to be <laughs> uh, the same thing in space. So my theory is we're going to have a chunk of Starlink depressurize a part of the International Space Station, creating an international outrage. And it's only that public pressure that's going to amount to anything close to a to a legislative push that actually has political will and public backing. Right on. Jeanette, you wanted to jump in? Right, okay, I did. You know, there was something Noah said in passing that really struck me when he, he, just, he just said, kind of as an aside, yeah, we don't have a good history of corporations, you know, being in charge of these things. And I, I keep thinking, we have not even managed to sort decolonization on Earth. We're still not really fully grappling with the legacy of that. And now we're talking about the final frontier. You know, it's it kind of I don't see how we can have the one conversation about space without bringing in the unresolved business of colonialism and especially extractivism, right? Like the extraction of natural resources on Earth. They seem to me inextricably linked. Well, and I think, you know, if we, if we frame this as a new kind of colonialism or if we frame it as a new kind of imperialism in the sense that on a technology level, we are seeing a new kind of digital imperialism in which major powers like the United States and China are exporting technology to the world that then extracts data, which they can then use to, you know, create machine learning models. You know, I, I was struck, Noah, by something you posted in the Zoom chat about a space court being set up in the United Arab Emirates, because it suggests that there will be a legal process, there will be a legal structure, there will be rules. The question is whether they're our rules or not, or whether it's like first past the post, it's whoever sets it up first, right? Whoever creates the court, whoever sort of attracts the commercial players or attracts the, the researchers and the consortiums that are really fueling a lot of this. You know, to what extent, rather than have the, 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 the proper governance system, are we instead seeing, just like there's a space race, a space governance race? In, in that it's a kind of race to set it up first. I'm, I'm curious, Alana or Noah, as part of your research, whether you saw the early trends of this in terms of an attempt to do regulatory capture in the sense of a government or a region just trying to say, hey, we'll do it first and therefore we'll be the default, we'll be the, the de facto. Thoughts on that? Did you want to start, Alana, or I, sure. I'll... Um, sure, from my perspective or what I've seen and read, um, I think a big kind of push came in 2015 um, under the Obama uh, administration, a uh, new space law or update to US space law um, was passed. Um, interesting enough, one of like the big things or that we see when we talk about space mining especially um, is that it kind of codifies, at least for the US context, that 
U.S. citizens or companies based in the U.S. Um, it lays out that it is legal or that they can actually own, sell, transport natural resources. It kind of establishes a position on that ambiguity kind of in the law as kind of a first mover, if you will, on that. And then we see two years after that, Luxembourg passing perhaps even more of an explicit law. The law is actually like in the name of it is on the exploration and use of space resources. The first line is that space resources can be owned, hmm. um, very explicitly setting that up. And in the context of Luxembourg, um, that, which is not a very like powerful space faring nation, um, in an interest to attract companies to come and register in Luxembourg um, and to kind of gain that capital, um, not capital, kind of gain those benefits of having those companies there. Um, then we kind of see Donald Trump last year issue an executive order, um, which made a very, uh, it reiterated a lot of the things already in the space law, but said that space was not, um, did not agree with it as a global commons, like rejected this concept, um, which was a very interesting, interesting, slightly terrifying kind of move that rejected like a wide, wide head. Well, like it was a health consensus that it's a shared commons, generally speaking. Um, so that's kind of a move to kind of account for this ambiguity and make a position um, on what should be done with that. Um, and even the Artemis Accords that Canada signed largely um, just reiterate principles already established in space law and the Outer Space Treaty, but they do take a position um, on natural resource extraction, um, kind of outlining that it's it felt the position that it falls within the realm of the Outer Space Treaty, that it's permissible under that, to which there is a bit of disagreement on whether that's actually the case or not. So kind of trying to establish that it is the case that you're allowed to kind of exploit natural resources when there's a little uncertainty on that fact. Well, and the Luxembourg example strikes me as relevant because it's one step away from Elon Muskberg, right? Like if you could have a tiny principality like Luxembourg sort of create a precedent in terms of using their very modest territory you know, on Earth as a means of expanding that territory, at least commercially in outer space, well, that's when a billionaire could make a deal with Togo or with you know a, a similarly small country that was willing in exchange for a lot of resources to you know shape their policy accordingly. So you almost anticipate kind of back doors in the multilateral framework of how space could be governed. I mean, we haven't brought up the UN yet in all of this because traditionally, or at least for the in the 20th century, that's where we associated this type of international or multilateral policy development. I mean, is there a UN space agency? Does the UN ever express any interest in space exploration and development? I ask this as someone who clearly is ignorant on the subject. I, again, I'm curious if you guys encounter this as part of your research, or maybe the UN is just asleep at the switch at a moment when it's an opportunity for them to be establishing leadership. Well, I mean, I think the, the, the potential for the UN um, is only going to go as far as the as nations are willing to invest in the multilateralism and institutions that uh, exist or could be created through the UN. I mean, we have these, uh, you know, Alana referenced the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, and there were, you know, a number of treaties, some of which have had more or less ratification or influence around that time, that sort of first chunk of the space age. And now we're seeing, um, you know, the testing, the early, early testing of this docking in, in this current age. Uh, and I think uh, the point that John made of we'll really see where this matters when it gets um, when it gets tested by an incident, whether it's orbital debris or whether it's going to be claimed for resources or 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 spatial territory. Um, you know, I think that's where the you know the rubber is going to hit the road. Or I could try a space metaphor there. I'm going to avoid it. Uh, it won't land. Um, but. You know, it'll it'll think, burn up upon entry. That's 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 absolutely right. Um, but you know, in the same vein of like we've seen this movie before, it's not as if we're unfamiliar with uh, 
small island nations working as fine, you know, having rules of uh, secrecy and lax uh, controls for hiding money or uh, certain countries being flags of convenience for international shipping and cruise lines. Like this is not unfamiliar territory. And you can understand, and not even internationally, you know, there's a reason why so many companies are headquartered in Delaware. Uh, but it's how I can understand why nations in a non cooperative way might pursue that strategy. You could understand why companies are pursuing that strategy. Uh, but how, how will it hold and who will, you know, where will the US? come down and where will others come down once some of these big, whether it's a liability incident or a true economic opportunity where, where jurisdiction comes to play. Well, and, and others might, you know, what I, what I find paradoxical uh, about the title of today's session, participatory space policy is that the way you're describing it is it is inherently participatory, right? No single jurisdiction, no, you know, single government can write that policy on its own. They could try unilaterally, but fundamentally there is a space ecosystem, both on a policy level and an industry level, that I, I think merits this type of not just cooperation, but participation. And and maybe the tension here is that we're straddling two eras where the space industry, aerospace, that's still old world, right? That's still highly centralized, uh, you know, vertically integrated organizations versus, you know, we're in the age of the internet, right? We're in the decentralized world, especially when it comes to how science and research is evolving. But also that's why Elon Musk is potentially such a disruptor because he very much thinks in terms of the digital world, especially on the level of disruption, especially on the level of asking for forgiveness rather than asking for permission, right? Which is sort of the Silicon Valley uh, model. So Mike, he here's where, I also I'll prime you, Mike. I'm gonna bring you into the conversation in a moment. Neil just threw up his hand. So we'll throw to Neil immediately. But after Neil, I, I want to bring you in, Mike, but I want you to try to be as like, you know, talk to us as if we're five, right? Like pretend that we don't know what you know about space policy and pretend that you're not as emotionally invested and conflicted about this area as you are. So I'm using that for you as a moment to prime yourself and meditate on that because you're posting gold in the chat, Jerry. And, and I need you to come on screen and help share some of that. But we'll throw to Neil first so that you have a moment to kind of focus and gather your thoughts. Neil, jump in. Thank you. We're looking at this, I think, a little too simplistically. And this is often the case. I think we need to break it down into uh, space policy or space policies, because there are different things that are potentially going to happen in space. One of those has to do with colonization. And we've been through colonization before. So we could actually take a look at the history of colonization when the European countries were colonizing the unknown world to them. And some of the things that occurred at that time and some of the things that we might be able to learn and the mistakes we can avoid or just things that we can expect to occur a second time. So that's one issue. The other issue has to do with this extraction notion and the fact that there are so many business interests that are going to be wanting to find whatever precious metals and diamonds and other kinds of things and to bring those back. And that's a business model of sorts. And the third one has to do with farming. Um, and it might be very different than the kind of farming we see on Earth, but it would be some kind of farming that is possible and maybe only possible in a space environment. So I think rather than trying to be too general, I think it might be useful to be more specific here. I'm also thinking of Antarctica because Antarctica might serve as a model. I try often to make connections. And if I think about Antarctica, that's a, an Earth-bound territory that is international and that uh, could form a bit of a model for what is, is possible to happen. And so nobody has claimed Antarctica. I do remember, Jesse, I'm old enough to remember the first Earth land, uh, moon landing. And I do recall quite clearly one of the first acts of business was to plant the American flag. 
on the moon. And I suspect China did the same thing. So those are some of the things that might be portents of, of events yet to occur. And the United States saying, well, we, we claimed it in 68, so the rest of you can all take a walk. And we'll, we'll, we'll lay up, put, up, put down our fences and make our maps and bring in our real estate agents and away we go. Um, these are some things that could happen. The other thing that's really interesting is this idea of trying to get to space that Alana referenced and the fact that there is so much traffic now in space uh, that it isn't really easy. And could it be that there'll be some international cooperation to establish a safe corridor, to establish a place where any nation can launch and get through the stratosphere and up because everyone agrees not to put any satellites into that space and that that becomes a way of getting in and getting out. And I think that a lot of science fiction might be able to inform some of this because even though science fiction is very often metaphorical, allegorical, uh, a lot of people, Isaac Asimov, for instance, would have thought about the scientific implications of space and woven those into some of his stories. Well, and, and I think that is the role of the artist, right? That is the role of, of the fiction author is to help translate our knowledge, to help make our knowledge more accessible and from a policy perspective to help empower us to be participants in our future, to be participants in how our society is governed. And of course, we've referred to it a few times. So, you know, I have to actually sort of put it on the table. We're talking about the Kessler syndrome or the Kessler effect. And this is the idea that we could reach a tipping point in which the space junk and space pollution literally makes it impossible for us to leave the planet. And I've, in discussions, often heard it put on the same plane as climate change. That it's one of those things that, yeah, you might imagine measures of how to deal with it after the fact, it would be far easier for us to just avoid it in the first place and engage in the types of mitigation, if not regulations, that prevent or minimize it from happening in general. Now, I, I agree with you, Neil, that I think it's fun to engage in space policy as a, an abstract or as like a, a big meta view area. But I think it's when we get tangible about it, when we get specific about it, that I think it's also both more accessible but also more comprehensible in terms of its relevance. And that's why we keep talking about Starlink. Because I do think that internet access is where space policy is most tangible, certainly for Canadians, because we have a lot of people in our country with really crappy internet. But I think it's true for a lot of the world, right? I think the opportunity of low earth orbit internet uh, uh, connectivity in general does have tremendous potential. So Mike, I've set you up. I mean, you know, that that really is me trying to give it to you on a platter here. Uh, you know, again, yeah. pretend that we're five-year-olds. Well, I, want, I, I mean, my but, issue- But with... be prepared for me to cut you off at some point. With that right. said, you're I, up. Okay, yeah. So what I'm just dying for is, to, is a panel of, of policy people to ask me questions and, and find out <laughs> how crazy that space industry is and how stupid it is. And the, 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 the proof is in Telesat. Um, the, the, the policies that have been sort of dished out by Canada um, against say what Starlink is doing and OneWeb has now turned from a company that went was, was all about, you know, making sure the space junk was okay. And we were only gonna put up 600 satellites to now they're just copying whatever Elon Musk does. And they're saying they're going to put it thousands of satellites too, and whatever. I mean, I, I have no idea that the, uh, the one thing important to know is that you'll see Morgan Stanley, I think is the company I could be wrong, but they're, they're a huge pumper of Starlink yet. They are admitting that there's no way that they'll even break even until 2030. So, or 2032 or something like that. So, you know, let's just get it right off there. If you want to sit, play in this Leo game, you have to be willing to lose $2 billion a year. Uh, just to stay a lot around, right? So you, you can see Elon Musk doing it. You can see a Amazon doing it. They have, you know, different agendas. They both own rocket companies. <laughs> that, that really helps when you're trying to like put a whole bunch of space junk into space. If you, if you can have rockets to take it up there, it's so much easier. So that's good. Um, and then they have things like Twitch. Amazon owns Twitch. So they're gonna have Jesse's all over the world pushing up on their Leo junk network, 
and and then and then people will just stay at home and broadcast all day it's perfect and then they also have amazon cloud which everybody should know is like 80 percent of the internet so they can like crunch all that numbers it's it's good for them but someone like telesat right they're just a company in the old space like jesse pointed out ses is similar they're old you know they have geo satellites anyone not know what geo satellites is I think nobody here knows what geosatellites is. But anyway. Oh, okay. So cut me off on that. Anyway, the policies are <laughs> like, when you actually look at what's going on, it's crazy because the Canadian government wants a space industry like they've always had. So they shovel money into MDA and they shovel money into Telesat. That's how they know how to do it. But Telesat and MDA got caught in this international thing where it's about go fast as you can and just start dumping money right and and canon is like what we don't we don't do that we just nicely give contracts to snc lavelin and uh mda Et le Telesat. Oh, okay this is an english broadcast sorry uh so you oh, know, oh, oh, au contraire au contraire parlez-vous français oh, et... oh le nuc de tout <laughs> je, je je speak a le nuc de tout well, okay, then it might be a soliloquy, but okay. there there might All be right. folks watching this archive in the future once LEO exactly. is available in Nunavut, and then they'll oh, yeah, want to so, hear yeah. this conversation. But well, alas, in, we digress. In, you were saying. Okay, so, yeah, and, and really, there's a, the, the, the most funniest shit goes on in, in Ottawa, right? So right now, everybody is, t you, you talk to anyone in Ottawa, and the only thing that matters is tell us that, Leo, it's... It's it, if you haven't read the MIT paper, it is so much better than any other Leo, except it doesn't exist. It has no money. It's never probably going to get built, uh, but we all have to pretend like it is. Meanwhile, OneWeb is actually coming to the Arctic and they won't even admit it to the government of Nunavut. And like Bell Canada is like signing the deals and like we're working on getting it going. They'll probably cut me out of it like always. But, you know, it'll like it's happening yet. The premier of Nunavut, whether it's through his own incompetence or the fact that he'll believe anything that is said by some idiot from ISID, uh, thinks that Telesat Leo is like the best Leo and that it's coming like next year or something, which is a physical impossibility to build satellites that quick, especially when you have zero dollars in the bank account, which is the case of Telesat. So, so yeah, the policies are just... You know, you could talk about it all day, but it's so crazy in Ottawa that like it's someone should make a just a comedy about it because it's a big joke. So let me jump in right there and point out that I have encouraged you to make that comedy about it here on Twitch. And 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 I'll give you credit that, you know, I primed you and that was pretty good. Like I felt okay. that that was a reasonable given your legitimate emotions. I'm to be that serious was because it's important. Yeah. yeah, and I felt that you you offered a very reasonable perspective because, you know, for those watching at home, this is a, a, a subplot in our ongoing telenovela that if you keep tuning in to salons in the future, you will learn a lot about the telecommunications industry from our comrade here, Mike. So, and, and I mean that with absolute respect yeah, because- with a K. Comrade with a K. I'll because you, you okay. invited me to the, what was it? The Canadian Space Summit? Yeah. That was yeah, you cool, invited man. me to the Canadian Space you were the Summit. Best one there, and like you. you but know, but hold on, you, hold you on. Know about the scams that you're supposed to, you're supposed to talk about Telesat. But but hold on, Mike. Let, let, I'm trying to yeah. also transition to bring in Sumit here. Right. So you know, on the one hand, I I went to that event with you, and you and I have talked about this a lot, and we've brought it up here in the salons a lot, and I feel that I'm maybe at ten percent comprehension, right? That I've put in like. Dozens of hours to try to understand satellite policy in context of telecommunications. And the one thing that I have gathered from you, which I think you just effectively articulated, is the conflict between the glacial pace of how satellite communication goes and the pace of the Internet, yeah. which was your point about Twitch. That here we are watching Twitch completely revolutionize how people make media, how people hang out in social spaces, and the satellite policies we're setting today do not anticipate that. And well, and one and, company has though, one company called Nuvuyak is wants to raid yes. the channel. Yes, we're, we are going to raid the channel. But again, that's because you're part of MetaViews. The Leo channel, the Leo channel. But that's because you're part Maybe of MetaViews. Next week. And you have the benefit of these salons. So yeah. I'm going to mute you, Mike. 
but I'll bring you back into the conversation in a bit, only because I know once I get you going, it's hard to get you to stop. But your point, which I'm going to reiterate, is how do we close the gap between setting satellite policy and having those policies benefit us, whether industry or society? And I think that's a huge conflict. And I think that's another reason why space policy has to be participatory why it has to involve as many diverse actors as possible, and why more of the general public should be informed and empowered and educated about space and space technology and space industry and most importantly, space policy. So I offer that as kind of a general context or general segue, because Sumit, you made a couple of good comments earlier in the chat, and you're one of my best ringers in that I know that I can throw to you at almost any time and you're going to step up. So by all means, Sumit, you're on. Uh, you know, I'll start by saying, I mean, I, I could one listen to you for hours, Mike. I think there's a lot there to capture. Um, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll start by going uh, using one of the terms that was used. I am not a space scientist. <laughs> I, I certainly have very little idea of this space. But you know, as I think about space policy, for me, space policy directly impacts Earth economics, right? And I, I just want to factor that in a little bit in, in that, at least from a couple of surveys that I read, there is a large percentage of small and medium enterprises in this game. Uh, whether it's you know the creation of satellites, parts, part of a supply chain, whatever that looks like. And I'm just curious as we're having these conversations around policy, like what is the representation of those units in this discussion? Uh, we talk about some of the big organizations, uh, you know, Elon Musk and, and the likes of them, but I hear very little around how this affects these, the supply chain that forms a part of this um, industry. And and just to add a layer to that, again, something that uh, I read brought that up, which is how does that get affected given the current state of the pandemic? Because these are the organizations that seem to be hit disproportionately. And so I'm, I'm just curious what you think, how that affects the policy discussion. That's a fantastic question. Uh, Noah, Alana, do either of you guys want to jump in on that? Uh I'll give it. I'll give it a shot, but I'll um, I'll I'll acknowledge that um, I don't think I have any uh, any particularly insightful answer to it. But it's never stopped me from trying before. Uh, but the um, you know I, I think that's it's an excellent question, especially in a sector like this that's so capital intensive. Uh, Mike referred to you know needing to burn two billion dollars a year to participate in you know one segment of it, uh, but you know if we think beyond the supply chain, you know all through the supply chain as you highlighted, it doesn't need to be quite at that level, but it's still uh, uh, quite expensive to play, um, and there's only so much we can do perhaps about the capital intensive part of um, of maybe R and D or, or construction, but it's also expensive to play on the regulatory side of things. And if we have regulatory barriers or even just uh, funding and support programs that are designed uh, with very specific interests in mind, and there's not an opportunity to hear from the way that the SME supply chain here is being affected, especially because they're not just smaller, but perhaps less visible if you think all the way through the supply chain, then if you need to hire you know top regulatory lawyers to be able to represent your interests in front of um, regulatory bodies or uh, you know expensive lobbyists to represent you in front of uh, of ministers to get your um, foot in the door then i think we have a, a a broken system in terms of representing those sme interests and we'll be much poorer for it uh, you know there's aerospace and space in particular has always been a very industrial policy heavy area. It's an area where uh, we've had national champions and big bets, uh, both in Canada and in other uh, countries. And uh, that tends to come at the exclusion of, uh, of new players or smaller players. And, you know, what are we, what are we missing? when you don't get invited to the conversation to share your perspective. Mm -hmm. Alana, did you want to weigh in on that? 
Yeah, just, um, so I, mean, I don't know if this is a report that maybe you read or had referenced, um, but the OECD recently put out a report, okay, um, on the state of the space industry, basically saying that COVID, some space companies are really still doing well during COVID, but small and medium-sized businesses are largely struggling. Um, and one of the kind of risks of that that they did outline on a very high level was that it could further concentrate industry dominance among a few key players um, in the space realm. Well, and, you know, sorry, go ahead, Sumit. Sorry, sorry I was just uh, going to jump in, uh, Elena. That's, that is the report that I read, and it, it was interesting. I mean, there wasn't a lot of recommendations in it, like a lot of reports are, but, um, you know, in particular, why I wanted to raise that question is that as we're talking about Canada's role in all of this, are there parts of that discussion that Canada could participate in and dig in deeper versus trying to tackle a bunch of things? And that's why I was thinking of this particular discussion uh, just given the uh, Canada's uh, general participation in the supply chain. Oh, for sure. Um, there's a section of the report. Um, Robin, who's normally is a MetaViews member herself, wrote a really good piece on kind of the, the role of competition policy potentially um, and modernizing that um, to respond to what's going on in the space sector, as well as other technology um, sectors that are more often based on Earth um, to kind of help push small, medium sized businesses and startups along, give them a better shot um, kind of in the space sector. Now, um, we are starting to run out of time. I just want to highlight a comment that John made in the Zoom chat, which I think made a brilliant analogy between what we're talking about in terms of the space industry and the power of platforms that uh, it's reasonable to believe that the space industry will probably organize itself based on platforms. I think John, you also, or John or Mike made the joke of Luxembourg as space as a service or space jurisdiction as a service. And all this evokes monopoly, right? All this evokes the way in which these platforms can be used to really monopolize these types of resources. Now, uh, Sharita, Murley, David, we ha haven't heard from you guys. I just wanted to give you a chance if you wanted to jump into the conversation. We tend to throw to David last because he often is able to bring some wisdom in stitching these threads together. So, Sharita, did you, is there anything you wanted to contribute to the conversation? Um, not so much a, a contribution. One of the things that, um, you know, I was thinking about um, really are the extractive industries in Canada and um, how they will figure eventually um, in terms of policy, but also in terms of exploration and extracting resources. These people have been in the business for a very long time. And um, I have read some things about what they're doing, for instance, in Africa, various countries in Africa. Um, and they're big players. And I wonder how they will then uh, be the big players in terms of, you know, the whole space industry. I think, I think that's part of the relevance, quite frankly, of Canadian space policy in that, you know, there's a, a moral and leadership opportunity, but there's obviously an economic and industrial opportunity. You know, the question to Mike's earlier evocation is whether we have the resources, whether we have the momentum to keep up with the global industry. And, and that might be a, a topic worth revisiting or recoming back to, which is not so much Canada's place in space policy, but Canada's place in R&D globally and how we can use our uh, intellectual resources to maintain global competitiveness. Merlatron, I mean, you think a lot about global competitiveness and industrial policy when it comes to creating 3D designs in Blender. I'm being coy, but we have to, of course, before ending, always turn to the mighty Merlatron to find out what he feels about a particular subject, in this case, space policy. Well, I, I can speak uh, from the perspective of, you know, young people and, um, and and other, I guess, people who have sort of been like following SpaceX um, in a, in a, a kind of lighter sense. Um, you know, I I think a big part of the the policy discussion is the narrative and the way that. Uh, the narrative is being presented because, you know, I, I hadn't really thought about uh, 
these kind of fundamental issues with space exploration and you know owning a planet or <laughs> something like that um but you know it I have to remind myself of the wise words of public enemy, you know, don't believe the hype because <laughs> it's, it's easy to kind of uh, get really excited about the, you know, these cool rockets and, and these daring feats that SpaceX is making. Um, but then like, you know, the other day I, I saw this video that was sort of talking about how um, they like with their first uh, SN8 starship flight, they hadn't actually got like, FAA clearance for the blast radius uh, analysis or something like that. Um, and which kind of speaks to their like jumping ahead of the regulation and policy. Um, but I also just think that there is so much sort of hype around this and that a lot of people aren't necessarily thinking about some of the potentially negative implications of, you know, colonizing Mars. And uh, I, I think to what someone was saying earlier, you know, the idea of uh, if you're that many millions of kilometers away, no earth governance is really gonna stand out there. It's gonna be sort of controlled by the corporation. Um, and, you know, there's obviously some potential dangers with that. So I, I think oh. it's just, you know, there's a lot of uh, narrative at play. Agreed. And I think narrative is the key word in part because, you know, we make an assumption that it's the corporations that are going to control that governance on Mars. It might be whichever astronauts or Martians happen to be there if, you know, it's self-governance. Now, Stro, I got to apologize. I totally forgot that you also hadn't had a chance to participate. It's because every time I look at your background, I start to trip out and I start to go to outer space. So please jump in, join in the conversation because you're a space cadet that I've known for a very long time. So we could have a whole separate conversation about your adventures in space, but I digress. Please let, share your thoughts today <laughs> on space policy and exploration. Uh, totally. You know, and I think that I'm just thinking about there's the science involved in the, the, the coolness of like, oh my God, we can do all this. But in the end, it's going it, to, the policies and who takes care of, like, once something is made, it's ultimately going to be who controls things. And just looping back to what Jeanette said, we still haven't figured out shit down here, right? So it's, it's and nothing's really changed in 400 years, right? We're still colonizing whatever we can to get as much control. Uh, and the only thing that I, I'm just thinking, like, this whole thing is really absurd. And the best way to think about space for me has always been the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And actually, I've uh, been watching a lot of Doctor Who with the kids and stuff. And uh, all these things that are coming up as, as to, like, yeah, it, none of it actually makes sense. And the science is really cool, but it's always going to be separate from the politics. And we have to really change the politics for it to mean anything uh, down here or up there. Well, and, and that's why I love these policy discussions, because they always end up coming back to, yeah, what about democracy? And, you know, what about better politicians? And what about electoral reform? And what about more transparency and more participation? So, you know, spot on, Stro. I'm, I'm as always, 100%. So, David, do you want to take us out? Do you have thoughts in terms of what part of this discussion you found interesting or some of the insights you might think would uh, take us out in terms of our future discussions. Oh, don't forget to unmute yourself there, David. From the what about perspective, we haven't talked about the what about other civilizations coming to us <laughs> outside of the final uh, frontier. Just a couple of comments. I, I was wondering, Noah initially mentioned the bullish on space, and I wondered who are the, who's the, doing the bearishness in space? And if you actually were using a kind of a stock market um, a metaphor a metaphor there. I was thinking about the, um, the concentration of wealth and the equitable, inequitable distribution of wealth. Um, and whether that, uh, I was thinking of the, you know, initially um, America, American government w was the f was the funding agency for space exploration. Now it's individuals, and uh, you know, was is that is that different from the uh, evolution of innovations in throughout 
the history of of ourselves and, and i i am um, i don't know the answer to that but just as uh, um john uh, mentioned the political uh, will settle on when there is a war a, sc a scary monopoly or a tragedy as as john typed that i was i was actually thinking you know policies and regulations in in the world that i lived in was i used to usually referred to, i tended to refer to them as organizational scar tissue mm -hmm. because they they um emerged in a re in response to something that really went badly and uh um what went really badly and then i was thinking also about um uh, uh greta and her take on space and what's the carbon footprint of space and what is the environmentalism of space and i was thinking when alana was speaking initially or earlier about you know space junk that we actually have a uh, that may be the the uh the the driver of uh, an important uh, element of uh, policy and regulation making as uh, environmental concerns get mapped onto onto the space world. I mean, it kind of evokes the idea that it would cost a, uh, a kind of small fortune in carbon credits just to do any kind of space exploration. And, and, and personally, it's why I used to kind of be opposed to kind of space technology in general, because I always felt, you know, let's fix this planet first before we start thinking that it's disposable and we could go somewhere else. But my position evolved in part because I recognize that in the pursuit of space, there's tremendous byproducts, there's tremendous side effects in terms of technology development that can be very beneficial. And I think telecommunications is a clear one because where I think Mike and I share a passion is it would be fantastic if we could have, you know, a very affordable high speed Internet access anywhere in the world. That certainly would be a boon to a lot of those remote and rural communities. But I, I kind of feel like most of our salons, uh, as usual, we've caught, we've raised more questions than answers, right? We've brought up more issues than we necessarily have time to address. So I, I thank all of you guys for uh, spending a little more than an hour having what I felt was a fascinating conversation. Thanks, Alana. Thanks, Noah, for the work you guys did and your generous time in coming and helping, you know, seed this discussion and help us understand it more. Uh, I, I do agree that maybe we should either have a serialized version of Mike's story as it continues to unfold or maybe even do like a special MetaViews show where, you know, we have might kind of guide us through the terrain of the dangerous world of Canadian telecommunications and space policy. Again, I think if we do it in little doses, it helps with our comprehension while, while also the, the story still unfolds because that is the nature of, you know, a space and satellite telecommunications policy. It moves slowly. But again, uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to our friends who are watching on Twitch. Thanks to those of you in the future watching us on YouTube. If you are currently watching this on YouTube on satellite connectivity that uh, either Elon Musk or OneWeb or Telesat has put it in the future, post a comment uh, telling us how wrong or right we were in this discussion around space-based policy. And uh, a reminder that we do the MetaView show here uh, every day, every weekday, and we do these salons every Tuesday. So roughly Tuesday, 1 p.m., you can come back and hear another interesting open conversation about policy and research and democracy. And with that said, uh, have a great week. Stay warm and stay safe and uh, take care, everybody.